It's good to see everybody. I appreciate you. I love you. Uh, just a few announcements. Um, this coming Wednesday, next Wednesday, uh, we're going to get together. We're going to have a pizza party. What do you think about that? Wow, that's not good. Carla's the only one who wants to show up. Anyways, Pastor Jennifer, I decided if you be here, you be here. But between 6 and 6.30, we'll have some pizza. So if you get here during that time, it's going to be informal. So all you need to do is just bring a drink and a snack or something. I think that's how we're going to work it out. But we'll get the pizzas. So if you want to dine with us in style, amen. Uh, Dixie cup all the way, solo, red solo cup. Uh, we're going to do it next Wednesday. It just was on my heart. I wanted to hang out with you guys. So between 6 and 6.30, again, it's not a set time if you can get in because praise and worship uh, team has stuff to do, and it'll be in the back. You kind of just grab it, you know, and eat and enjoy yourself and, and then get ready for service. So about 6 to 6.30. Is that okay? And uh, we just wanted to bless you and be with you. So that is this coming Wednesday, I guess. You want to get with Sarah, I guess, and get with you as far as drinks and snacks or something or pastors in. I don't know how you... Huh? But, but you'll be here at 6.30. Okay, but you'll be here at before 7. Yeah, amen. Before 7. Okay. But there'll be something left for you. But anyways, <laughs> I, you can't nail her down. It's like, let me try this out. So, but anyway, this is going to be a great time in the Lord. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, like I said, just figure it out. Y'all know how to get drinks and... And, and all that stuff, and uh, so we'll we'll do some pizza and hang out together next Wednesday before service. All right. Anyhow, and and some other announcements. Um, we're going to be doing live stream, as you know, uh, February seventh. That's our Wednesday live stream, and then we'll be doing is it the eleventh, the following Sunday live stream. So they're going to you know from curtain to curtain, cover to cover. It's going to be a great time, open to close. And uh, how so many people have contacted us already who heard and are real excited about it. And uh, I'm just, I'm looking forward to it because, again, there's so many folks that consider Ignited their home church. And, and literally, they wait for it to upload and, and they watch the services. And then some, you know, have to wait till Thursday or whatever to hear this message tonight. So now they'll be able to get a live stream. And I'm just so grateful for the technology, number one, but I'm grateful that we have uh, so many people that are out there that want to be a part of this. And uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing God is doing. And it's growing every day. Every day it's growing. And we're so grateful for that. Uh, one other thing I want to tell you about, and I want you all to pray for me is uh, I told you the Lord has been speaking in my heart about expanding some things in media and reaching out in various places, especially because we're, we're so close to the end times. And I feel like more ministry has to come out of this house. And that is why we're going to do Wednesday nights uh, and also going to put them on YouTube. So Wednesday nights will be on YouTube and uh, we'll, we'll be able to reach that uh, group of people that normally don't watch live stream or they don't download the uh the app so there's so many different avenues and so we're excited about that so that's one new thing i wanted to tell you about also i'm going to be doing interviews here in the uh, very near future interviewing prophetic voices from ignited life now so you know I, I i usually get interviewed and that's been a great thing and i still will be interviewed but now i'm going to be doing the interviews Amen. And so I really felt in my heart that there's some prophetic voices out there that really the body of Christ doesn't know a lot about that are saying some very powerful things and they're confirming what's coming out of this house. So I know it's from the Lord. And so uh, I'll be starting that here in the next couple of weeks. I already have our first guest lined up, which will be Lynn Liaz. Amen. And yeah, we're going to, she's agreed to it. And I said, you know, I told her a few months ago, I said, you know, when I start doing interviews, I said, you're going to be the first person because, you know, she's been so benevolent to this house and honored me so many times on the, on her program. And so I'll be uh, interviewing her and then there'll be other names that, you know, you don't even know about. And so we'll just see how this goes. And I don't know if it's going to be every week or every other week or whatever, but we're just going to get the word out because the days are so short. 
and the, and the hour is so so uh, so so dangerous. Amen. So pray for me, man, that God will just continue to bless and, and give us wisdom. Father, thank you for all these things. We cover them in the blood of Jesus. We love you tonight, and we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we're all gathered here to de- together to hear your word. We pray, Father God, that you would bring us into all truth. Lead us into all truth tonight. Bless those that are listening and watching. Bless those, Father, that call this house their house. And, Father, thank you for them, and I ask your blessings upon them. Hide me now behind the shadow of the cross. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. All right, so that's cool. I'm real excited about it. And we're just going to keep moving forward and continue glorifying the Lord. If you haven't had a chance to look at the Facebook post that I did today, it's very powerful confirmation about the word the Lord gave me in 2015 about God dealing with the NFL. And uh, there was another word that was confirmation to that. So if you get a chance, go see that. Uh, and see what the Lord is saying. All right. Last time we got together, man, we're talking about the book of Acts. The book of Acts. We're just getting started, just getting our feet wet. And uh, I am looking forward to where we're headed on this. The book of Acts. The last time we got together, we, t- we said these, these few opening statements. The book of Acts is more than a historical account of the first church. It is a perpetual template of the modern church. All right, so the book of Acts is more than a historical account of the first church. It is a perpetual template of the modern church. In other words, we should still be living the book of Acts. We should still be teaching out of the book of Acts. We should still be doing our church government and our structure and our Christianity out of this template, out of this mirror called the book of Acts. It is not the Acts of the Apostles. It is a demonstration and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. All of our Bibles, or most of our Bibles, will say the Acts of the Apostles. Again, I believe it is the Acts and the manifestation and the very revelation of the Holy Spirit on the earth. Amen? Through a group of people called the church. So the book of Acts is the continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ, fulfilled through his Spirit-filled church. Let me say that again. The book of Acts is a continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ fulfilled through his spirit-filled church. So you and I have the opportunity to fulfill everything Jesus began to teach and to do. That's exciting. It's exciting. And if we take that mandate and mission and assignment, I believe that God will pour his glory on us in in a greater measure. So the book of Acts is the handbook of the church. The book of Acts is the handbook of the church. Many times denominations and organizations, they leave the first teachings and the first understanding of the church and they go into their own doctrine, their own philosophies, whatever they think works for that organization and they, they leave the true handbook of the word of God and have their own mindset of what they think it should be according to times and trends. Let me tell you something. This word right here, it never fades away. It is always trending. It is always all-powerful. It is still the best-selling book in the world. Come on now. It's the only author that was in the beginning and still will always be, and he is the ancient of days. So, uh, yeah, we've gone far away from that. So the book of Acts is the handbook of the church. And then finally, I gave you this, this last plank or statement. The book of Acts is non-denominational. I love that. I love that because so many times you have these theologians, these frozen chosen, if you will, these great scholars of the word, and they completely bypass the book of Acts. They say it's over. They say everything has died with the apostles. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. The party's over, and now let's just hold up the fort until Jesus comes. What a lame life that is. Amen? Uh, I want to be burning with the power of the Holy Spirit and the fervency of Jesus Christ, doing all that he began to teach and do. I want to be a finisher, and I want to be a part of it. Amen? And so uh, it's non-denominational. I don't look at it as this is all the Pentecostals own this, the Charismatic own this, or this denomination is against it or whatever. This is non-denominational. This should be the living body of Christ moving in kingdom power. All right, so Acts chapter 1, we talked about this uh, being the author was, was Luke, and he began to talk to uh, this friend of God, 
when it says O Theophilus, which means friend of God or lover of God, it was a, a person who must have had some type of authority, probably a Roman uh, official to whom Luke was writing to. And so Luke uh, just said, hey man, I'm going to continue on from where I was in the book of Luke and into the book of Acts. And we see that. We see that uh, he begins to do that and teaches on that. And then we talked about how that Jesus in the Old Testament was the great promise. He was the great promise. And in, the, in his life, obviously, he came and fulfilled that promise. But the New Testament, the promise was what? The Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would come. Because again, I think, I think Jesus, that he walked on the earth, but I'm glad he went to heaven. Because when he went to heaven, he tagged him with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost poured out upon all flesh. Now all of us can feel Jesus. Come on now. I, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not a good sharer. I'm not a good sharer. Sometimes I don't want to share. How about you? And if Jesus was in this room, I think some of us would get into a fist fight trying to get near Jesus. Somebody look at me. You know what I'm uh, I'd hate to wrestle Brother Mike over Jesus, but I'd try, amen? Uh, because uh, I, I want to be near him. But thank God I don't have to wrestle Brother Mike. And Jesus is here by his Holy Spirit. Amen. So that's the good thing. The great promise. So don't forget that. John 15, 26. So that was last week. And there's so much to go over. But let's get into tonight's teaching. The book of Acts. All right. The book of Acts. The first church. Watch this. You need to write this down. This is going to be the first planks we're going to walk on. The planks of truth. The first church with birth in power. The last church will be bathed in glory. The first church was birthed in power. We're going to see this as we get into this teaching. It was birthed in power. But the last church will be bathed in glory. The former and the latter reign is coming down. The mighty manifestation of the Holy Spirit, God's last outpouring of revival power for the greatest harvest known to man. That's what's coming. So the first church was birthed in power. The last church will be bathed in glory. Our journey into the future must be paved with the discarded truths of the past. Our journey into the future, talking about a church, I'm talking about a group of people, I'm talking about you individually and myself individually. Our journey into the future must be paved with the discarded truths of the past. Again, there's so many things in the Word of God that get discarded. There's so many truths about how the first church lived, how the first Christians lived, we discard it today because it doesn't fit trends. It doesn't fit our lifestyle. It doesn't fit our entertainment schedule. Wish I had somebody here. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit things in our life that, that we live, so we cut the gospel, we cut the word to fit us instead of us be cut into the mold of the word. See, we're, we're, we're very bad at that as Christians because we want a God to whom we can control. We want a pocket God. We want a pocket God. We want a shelf God. We want a pantry God. We want an entertainment God that we can control and a church that we can control, a preacher that we can control, a Christianity and a life that we can control to where we can still have enough of God to get to heaven, but we can get enough flesh to feel good. Well, I feel like this is Sunday already. But it's the truth. And so, going back to what I said, our journey into the future must be paved with the discarded truths of the past. We're finding in this hour that the true remnant of God, the real hungry people of God that I talk to and I have conversations with and I fellowship with uh, online telephone calls or whatever, these people, like yourself in this house, are just hungry for the things of God and could care less about the politics of church, could care less about the nominationalism, could care less about the color of the carpet and all the craziness that goes on. So that's powerful, and what they're looking for is the way church used to be. Which, which it sounds, it sounds anti-present, it sounds anti-modern, but it's just the Bible way. What they're really saying is we want to go back to or we want to embrace when God showed up. We want to embrace church when people got healed. We want to embrace church where the preacher would preach. We want to go uh, to a church where we hear about salvations in our community and whatever and miracles and so on and so forth. Okay? So our journey into the future 
It must be paved with the discarded truths of the past. Watch this. The modern church has lost its power and forfeits the glory. The modern church has lost its power and forfeits the glory because we failed to stay true to our foundation. Try it again. Our modern church has lost its power and forfeits the glory because we have failed to stay true to our foundation. What is the foundation? The word of God. Who's the chief cornerstone? Jesus Christ. So if anybody knows anything about construction, it's not a good thing to move the foundation. I think you want to keep the foundation sturdy, unless you go hire a ramjack and they fix whatever came apart. But you want to keep that foundation steady and then build upon that foundation. But the problem with the modern church is we're trying to redo the foundation and we're making it unstable because that's the wrong foundation. The only foundation is Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the word of God is the only stability for Christianity and for mankind. So the modern church has lost its power, forfeits its glory, because we have failed to stay true to our foundation. Listen, I'm not talking about wearing your hair up in a bun and, and, and wearing dresses all the way down to where you trip over and all that stuff. We're not talking about that. A lot of those things are man-made anyways. But what we're talking about is the word of God, the traditions of faith, of living a sold out life, rather being in the house of God than at some sports entertainment place or being in front of a television with your feet kicked up and, and all the things that we do as comfort Christianity. Listen, the first church was raw, radical, and on fire. And you're going to see that in a few minutes. And, and I think that we can be more radical, more on fire, more raw for God than them because we have things to help us become that. In other words, we have a better life around us that provides for us the ability to do that. Listen, I, I was telling somebody uh, today about the, the power of God and, and about the Apostle Paul, and I said, you know what, he reached the world, they church reached the world, and they didn't even have a cell phone. We got all the stuff that we need at the fingers, at our finger touch, and we can't even get to church. We can't even pray. We can't even do these things. These guys walked on cobblestones. Man, they had to worry about bandits and animals and craziness while they traveled and so on and so forth. And we got cars, airplanes, helicopters, boats, buses, trains, subways. Come on, somebody. We got all these types of things to, to get to the world, and we can't even get to our neighbor. Yeah, I'm just helping out a little bit here. So the modern church has lost its power and forfeits its glory because we failed to stay true to our foundation. We, we've gotten off of the foundation. We're building over in the dirt. We're adding on a new building, but we're not even on the original foundation. We're over there in the dirt. We're in the mud. We're listening to some guy stand up because he's eloquent and he has all these degrees and all this fanciness about him. He's trending and he's popular. But yet we aren't winning the world to Christ because we've lost the true power and the glory and our foundation. Amen. So that's how I'm starting out tonight. How's that? Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We left off at verse 8. Is that right? But verse 8 so good we're going to read it again. But you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. After that, the bishop lays hands on you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry about that. You shall receive power after you send your tithe in. Nope, nope, wrong. Let me, let me fix my translation. Let me, there it goes. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you shall be lazy. No, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the power of the Holy Ghost was coming. Jesus is prophesying and he's promising the disciples and everybody that would uh, walk on this planet and would receive him as Lord and Savior that there was coming a power transfer. There was coming a releasing of dunamis power. Remember, dunamis means dynamite also represents a dynamo that continues to produce energy. That's why when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you continuously build up your inner man. Jude says what? It's like an edifice. It's a tall tower. That's why you pray in the Holy Ghost. 
And that's what the Holy Ghost does for you and I. It causes us to have that reigniting power. That's why when we wake up in the morning, those that understand the power of the Holy Spirit, we understand that His mercies are renewed every day. And we, you know, it amazes the non-believer. They say, man, how do you keep going? You've gone through this and you've gone through that and this happened and that happened. Hey, man, it's the Holy Ghost. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. Not hope, maybe so, but the word hope there means expectation. So I expect God to do something great when I get up in the morning. I expect God to do something great in your life and do something great in this church. Amen? That's what he wants us to do. So, so watch that. He says, you're going to have the, the power, the dynamite power to be witnesses. We talked about that, about being a martyr. And then it says, to the uttermost parts of the earth and all these different regions, meaning that we cannot stay in this four walls and be called a church. A true church is a missionary church. Let me try that one more time. The, a true church is a missionary church. Two-thirds of the name of God is go. He's a go God. So we have to go, and you don't have a choice of color, you don't have a choice of neighborhood, you don't have a choice of social status, you're supposed to go, okay? Now he said this, verse 9, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Now read this with me, and look at it with me. Here they are, they're with him, he's speaking to them, he's prophesying, he's promising them the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then all of a sudden, he begins to leave in a cloud. Watch this. And while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. I mean, I just, I pictured myself in this situation just sitting there looking. I mean, he's sitting there talking to you. It's not like he vanished. You know, you ever talk to somebody for, and thought they were behind you and then they're gone and you're like, where'd they go? And they turn the corner or whatever. This is just sitting here talking to them, him and then all of a sudden he's gone. I mean, you're just watching him go up. Well, the word there, I want you to write this down, is N-E-P-H-E-L-E, Nephile. N-E-P-H-E-L-E, Nephile, 3507. The reason I wanted you to have that, because that is the same illustration, the same concept in the Hebrew of when the cloud was over the children in the wilderness, the children of Israel. The same glory. He was what? A pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. That glory, it was a Shekinah glory. So again, here they are. He's promising them the power of the Holy Spirit. Hang loose here. I'm going to anoint you to be a martyr. I'm going to anoint you to be a witness. I'm going to anoint you to go to the four flung corners of the earth. And then as he's talking, verse 9, he begins to be taken up by that glory. Man, I'll, I'm telling you right now, that had to have been a sight. That had to have been a moment to go, oh man, what a tremendous, tremendous moment. Now watch verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly, now watch this, they're looking steadfastly towards heaven. So let's go historical for a second, and then I'll get into some, some practical today uh, a, a rhema, rhema word for us. But, but they're standing there, they're watching, he's going up. Now, you ever watch a balloon go? You can watch a balloon pretty, pretty good distance, you know, and then, it, then it's gone. But th there he goes, and they're watching him, and the glory, and he's going, and he's going, and he's going. Oh, man, verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel or white garment. Wow. So now we see the glorious cloud. Jesus is ascending into heaven. These guys are still looking up. Could you see them at first looking, and then they got their hands like this, and then they're doing, you know, they're watching him go up. And now two angels appear. It says two men, but it's two angels appear. And they're wearing white, or they have that white look. Let me give you that word, because it's important that I give it to you. It's L-E-U-K-O-S, Locos, L-E-U-K-O-S, 3022. Some of you all remember from my past teaching, that talks about the glory. That talks about the light or the bright brilliance that was upon the angels and upon the Lord Jesus in the book of Revelation. It's the same word, okay? Very powerful. So while they were standing there, there's these two angels, you know, they were glistening. The word actually means dazzling. 
the lights, the garments were almost like lamps. They were like lights, and they could just see the glory coming out of them in a tremendous way. I'm going to talk, you, you want to talk about an awesome day? You want to talk about an awesome 40 days with the Lamb of God? I mean, this was the accumulation of all. This was the total, totality of it all. They're hanging out with Jesus for 40 days. He's preaching and teaching kingdom. And then as he's talking, he says, man, you're going to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you. I'm going to empower you and all these great things. And then he starts to go up. And they're just watching him. And then the next thing you know, here comes two angels. That is a good day. That's a great service, don't you think? That's a wonderful day. But watch this. I want, to sh- I want you to see what the Holy Spirit wants us to see in this. Notice this. Jesus prophesies. He promises. He's going to receive. We're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be empowered to go to the world. So he gives us and he gives the disciples a worldwide commission. You might want to write that down. A worldwide commission of evangelism and power. Because he not only promises power, but he promises a commission. He promises an assignment, a mission. I'm going to send you out, but I'm not going to send you out as orphans. I'm not going to send you out broke. I'm not going to send you out weak and anemic. I'm going to send you out with Holy Ghost power. In fact, the same power that raised me from the dead will be on you, and the same glory that's on me now as I rise up, guess what? That's going to be on you. But he shows us something else. Now, you've got to look at everything. Now, we're going to leave a historical point, and we're going to get to the, the, the rhema behind that. We're going to get to the deep understanding. Now, notice this. Jesus ascends in a cloud. He goes into heaven, right? He promised them the, the, the Holy Ghost. He promised them the commission. He anointed them in, in that way of, of speaking the word. Then, as they're watching, two angels appear. Why is that important? Because Jesus is showing the disciples, which will become the apostles, he's showing them that angelic activity will be a part of the new church. You need to write that down. See, if we study this just historically, we miss this point. And there were two guys in white raiment, and they showed up, and they said, hey, what are you looking at? How many of have been taught that? And that's it. Everybody goes home, wow, two angels, that's cool. No, it was more than that. It's, there's more understanding. There's no more symbolic prophetic reality there in parallelism that Jesus was saying, this glory, this power is going to be upon you. You're going to go to the nations of the earth. You're no longer going to be just Jerusalem uh, ministry people. You're going to be witnesses throughout the earth. But I'm going to leave you this power, and I'm also going to leave you with help. Okay. So you want to write that down. Angelic activity was a part of the first church. Well, what does that mean? That means to me, if it was a part of the first church, it would be a part of the last church. If it was part of the first church, then it was part of the second century church and the third century church and on and on and on. Angelic activity is a part of the end time church. Angelic activity is a part of your life. How come, it, it, you know, in our old teaching, and I don't, want to, I don't want to lambast denominations or whatever, but our old teaching, our old churches we used to go to, you know, they'd always say, the angels of God, behold their, your, your face or his face, you know, talking about you having a guardian angel. How many of y'all remember that? And you heard it for years and years. I've got a guardian angel that stands before the Lord. Well, we can understand that and we accept it, but we don't accept and understand that we have angelic beings helping us right now in Christianity, that we have angels over this church, angels in this church right now. The glory of God is in this house. Jesus is right here in this place right now. And if he ever wants to, he'll allow us to open our eyes and we'll see all that's around us. Hmm? When you're driving down the road, hey, BMW had it pretty close, didn't they, with those angels hanging on the four fenders? How many of y'all remember that commercial? I looked and I was like, well, they don't kind of look that small, but some of y'all don't remember that commercial. But you have them. The way some of y'all drive, you have a legion. You've got a, bat- a battalion of angels. I'm not looking at anybody. I'm just looking. I'm just looking. I don't want to start a fist fight in the parking lot. But So you have to see this. So, so the first church, the church, us right now, we were given this angelic opportunity an assignment with us, connected with us, so that we can fulfill the last day harvest. You will be surprised, and I will be surprised, in the end of our days when we stand before God, how many angels were in operation in our lives. 
One day I'll teach on, on angels when the Lord releases me to do that. But there's, there's such a fascinating teaching on angels uh, that we need to do someday. All right, so watch this. So that's the first point I wanted you to see uh, besides the power and, and the commission. And so the with wide apparel, verse 11, which also said, you men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven this same Jesus, which is taken up from you unto heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So that's cool. The angels begin to speak. They begin to minister to the heirs of salvation. Isn't that what the Bible says? And they begin to say that this same Jesus, watch it one more time. He said, you men of Galilee, why are you stand gazing up into heaven? So they're still looking, wouldn't you? I mean, I was just talking to him, and all of a sudden, he just, he's gone, man. And they're still looking up. He says, listen, that same Jesus, not another Jesus, that same Jesus, what does that mean? The one with the nail-scarred hands. We're talking about that same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner. What does that mean? He's going to come back just the same. That means he's going to come back. He's going to descend. Come on. With a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. He's going to descend in that like manner. He's going to come back in his glory. We're going to see him. Everyone's going to see him. The Bible says the book of Revelation, they're going to see his pierced, whom they pierced. They're going to see all of that. Man, what a day. He's coming back. He's coming back. And we're going to get to see him just the way he left. Amen. And so, so the world will get to see him because at one point we're going to be raptured out at some day at some time. But no man knows that day. That's, is that right? So we work and we labor. But the day is coming. But check this out. The angels were giving the disciples and the apostles some very fabulous and foundational truths that belong inside of the church of Jesus Christ today. And that is his return. That's another thing you need to write down. So it wasn't only the baptism with power. It wasn't only being a witness and sent out on assignment and on a commission. It wasn't only that he was going to leave angelic activity, uh, uh, angel power, angel uh, beings moving in our behalf, ministering. But he was also leaving us a kingdom fact that is central to our message and that's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the return of Jesus is a kingdom message. It should be central to our message. It should be foundational. You say, well, that, that sounds a little odd. Doesn't every church believe that? No, there's a lot of churches don't believe he's, he's going to come back. There's a lot of people out there that they're, they're, dis, they're discarding. They're getting away from these truths. They're getting away from the virgin birth. They're getting away from his resurrection. They're getting away that he ever ascended. They're getting away from the fact that did he even die? I'm telling you, there are a lot of fruits, flakes, and nuts out there when it comes to Christianity. You better know your Bible. You better know the word of God. You better know the preacher you're sitting underneath because there's a lot of cycle babble that's out there that is designed to deceive even the very elect. So you better know the word, okay? So that's another plank I want you to see, that it's part of the central message because that's our hope. That's our hope. Our hope, number one, is that when we die, we go into heaven. We have a glorious resurrection. But if we are, we're here with the coming of the Lord, that's the great hope that we can be with him forever, that he'll take us with him. So it should be central, all right? And listen, the other part about this is, if we have this understanding that Jesus is coming back the way that he came, and, and, all, and the way that he left, and all the glory and all these things, then we would live more holier lives if we believed it. If it became central in our preaching, if it became central in our warnings to our lives to say, hey man, live right before God, because you never know. Live right before God, because you don't know the hour. It would cause you to live in holiness. Let me, let me give you an example the Holy Spirit reminded me of. He reminded me when I used to be home, at, home alone without my parents. How many of y'all remember when you was home alone without your parents, Animal House broke out? 
Some of y'all need to Google Animal House, figure out what that was. Until mom and them showed up early from their shopping trip. And you didn't hear the car door slam because ZZ Top was playing. Or whatever your freaky music was at the time. And it was too late until you heard, oh my God! Thump, 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 thump. And everybody dove out of windows, broke your back screen. <laughs> but had you known, if you had the guy that was supposed to be the lookout, who happened to go to the bathroom and missed it, <laughs> you would have been okay if he would have been on his spot and you saw a mom come, you would have been living pretty holy. Is that right? That was the example. That reminded me of that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I remember that day. Uh, that, was, that was pretty crazy. But that's exactly the situation. When you have the understanding of what the Lord is going to do, he's going to come in a cloud. He's going to come in that day. He's going to be unaware in a, in, in a lot of different ways. And I'm not going to get into the teaching of, of, of the, the rapture and, and all those different things. But, you know, there is a season of time when Jesus can literally open the skies and call us home. We're getting closer to that day. There's a few biblical things that are not yet in line, and that's why I don't want to teach it right now. But it's the same concept. You know, had we known mom was coming home, I think we would have lived a little better. In fact, if mom was home or dad was home, we wouldn't have had no party anyways. So anyways, going back to that, that's the best illustration I can give you. But it's the same concept. If I have the understanding that my Lord is returning, if I have the concept that he's watching me, if I have this mindset and understanding that very soon or at any moment he could return, guess what? I'm going to live a lot more holier than I'm living right now. It's called the fear of the Lord, okay? So long way around the corner, but that's, that's something that we have to see here. So watch it. He says, man, he says, you're looking for him. He's going to come back just like he said. So that became rooted and engrafted and imparted into the very hearts of the apostles. They're still being taught, by the way. Verse 12, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount Olives, or Mount Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come in, they were, uh, went up into the upper room where they abode both uh, Peter and James and John and Andrew and, and uh, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Aphelius, and Simon, Zelots, uh, Zelots and Judah, the, um, or excuse me, Judas, the brother of James. So watch this, verse 14. So they're all together now. They're, they're, they're coming together. They all, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brother. And I like to read that because Mary was in the upper room. I just say that to my Catholic friends. Mary was there, okay? So if Mary was there, we should be there, right? That's what I tell them. Verse 14. These all continued. So they were in continuation of prayer. They were together. They're waiting. They're, they're waiting for the promise. They're waiting for the day of Pentecost. In verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up. I want you to kind of highlight that. Peter stood up. He finally stood up. Peter finally got some things right. Peter started to get in some boldness about him. Something happened in those 40 days with Jesus. Something happened with those kingdom teachings. Though Peter wasn't there just yet, he still, he was getting, he was getting there. Okay? Now, those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, uh, the number of names together were about 120 men and brethren. This scripture must be fulfilled or must needs be fulfilled. This is verse 16, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before promising Judas, which was gone to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained part of the what? of the ministry, all right? So he's talking, he's kind of giving a little historical fact here. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder and the midst and all his bowels gushed down. Now as we're talking about the suicide of Judas, he must not have tied the rope very well, but he did die and he did have that moment. In verse 19, 
And it was known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem, insomuch as that the field is called to this proper name or proper tongue, Alceldima, uh, Alceldima, and that is to say the field of blood. Now I, brought, I read that for a reason because it wasn't the field of blood of Judas; it was the blood of Jesus, because it was bought in order to betray him. Okay. So it wasn't the fact that Judas killed himself there. And it's written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein. And his bishopric, let another take, means his office. Okay? So there was going to come a time when this takes place and now there's a time for change. But, but watch what happens here. Wherefore are these men which have uh, companioned with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and around us, or among us, beginning from the, the brethren of John until the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to the witness with us of his resurrection. So he's giving you, this is Peter now, this is pretty cool, because Peter's now getting some understanding, he's taking leadership, he's getting some instruction, okay? And that's good, because Peter, he was, he was pretty wild, wasn't he? He'd rather cut somebody's ear off. But now he's starting to get a little structure, a little maturity. Okay? Verse 23, watch this. And they appointed two, Joseph, called Barsabbath, or yeah, Barsabbath, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, Show whether of these two thou hast chosen. So highlight that somewhere in your notes. They begin to, to get it right. They went and prayed. They said, hey, God, you know, we, we need to know. We need to know, Lord Jesus. We, we need to know who's going to take this place. So they began to begin to pray, and, and they did, you know, pretty much what they're supposed to do. Is that right? Watch verse 26. And they, they gave forth their lots... And the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, they started out by doing the right thing, by praying. Here's Peter. He's, he's, he's standing up. He's understanding he, all this stuff that goes around him. I mean, I think I would get it. I think if I'm standing there and I see Jesus go up in a cloud, a glory cloud, and as I'm still looking and my neck's hurting by looking up and I'm staring, all of a sudden these two angels pop out of nowhere and start talking to me, I think I, I would get it. Wouldn't you? I mean, some people need to have an experiment like, experience like that to get it. But I think for me, I would have been rock solid and I would have said, yeah, I think everything Jesus was saying is true. So they got it, they obeyed, they went into the upper room, so on and so forth. Now they started to pray and they said, God, give us the answer. But then the next thing you see that they do is they begin to cast lots. Now, here's what I wrote down. Here's what the Holy Spirit showed me, and I want you to write this down. It was the Old Testament mindset operating in New Testament faith, and it doesn't work. It was an Old Testament mindset operating in New Testament faith that doesn't work. In other words, they tried to pray, but then they went to the Old Testament style of getting an answer, and they cast lots. Now, you'll find out later on they didn't go that route. You'll find out after. Everything after the Holy Spirit came changes the whole dynamics and model of the church because they're still operating on post-resurrection. They're still operating on Old Testament principles. Uh, the epistles hadn't been written by Paul. The doctrines of the faith, you know, the great foundational truths have not been laid out. But I wanted you to see this because this is the way the modern church operates. We operate with an Old Testament mindset trying to make it work with New Testament faith or New Covenant faith, and it doesn't work. You see, what they did was they would take pebbles or they'd take stones and they'd write the names of the two people upon it and they would take it and they would shake it just like we would play a little bit of craps or whatever, they, whatever you play. Uh, we like Scrabble. Does that match? Is that like a Scrabble? No. Huh? 
Yahtzee. That's it. That's what, that's what I was looking for, Yahtzee. So it's just like that. And whatever name came out, that was the one that they chose. Well, again, this was Old Testament principle. They tried to do it by praying, but then they went back to that Old Testament principle. And this is the mindset of today's church, that we're trying to do things that are in the flesh. We're trying to do things figuring out ourselves. We're trying to vote on this and vote on that. And we're having all this, this craziness going, in, going on in the church instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and allowing God to speak clearly. Do you see that? And so uh, that's another plank I want you to write down. That the Old Testament mindset uh, operating in a New Testament faith and it doesn't work. You say, how, does it, how, how did it not work? Well, yeah, they picked Matthias. They put him in position. But you know what? You never heard of Matthias ever again in the Bible. Never. Ever. Never. His name was never mentioned again. So what happened? How'd that work out? Don't know. Uh, Revelation 21, you know, talks about the 12 apostles. And, and some theologians will argue and say, well, that's Matthias. And others will say it's Paul. You know what? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't have the names. I think it's Paul. But uh, it, that's not the teaching tonight. The point I want you to see and what the Holy Spirit's trying to lay down for us as we begin this journey into what the New Testament church looked like is that they were struggling with walking by faith. They were struggling with their leadership ability to do the right thing because they weren't full of the Holy Spirit who would teach you and lead you to all understanding. And that's what modern churches are doing today. They're doing all of these things. They committee everything. Everything's a committee. Everything's an advisory board. Everything, let's vote on this. Everything is so, oh, I don't even, I don't, yeah, well, I don't, I, there's a word I want to use, but I'm just not going to use it. But they're, they're, it, it, it's so fleshly, the whole operation and this confusion. And, and how, many all, how many all know what I'm talking about? How many all been in churches where they have business meetings and it's a fist fight? Elder knows what I'm talking about. You, you know, you'd be arguing, the pastor would be cussing, and the demonized deacon would be hollering, and the evil elder would be, you know, threatening and... Before you know it, uh, you know, and then they come back out in front of everybody, praise the Lord, we had a good meeting, numbers are high, and God is good. God is good. <laughs> While he's bleeding. See, that's, and, and, then, and then not only that, then we use it in the other form or fashion of trusting other people for our knowledge of God, trusting other people to pray for us and say, well, what do you think God's saying? About? No, you go find out what God is saying. I ain't casting lots for you. You find out what God is saying for your life. Amen. There's times you need help. I got that. So this is the final thing I want you to see. So Matthew, he was never mentioned again. I would think that if that was a really good pick, he'd probably be there. Just guessing. Just asking you. Just letting you think about it and study it out for yourself. But the truth of the matter is this is that we have to do everything by the Holy Spirit. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit. We have to ask God to show us. I don't need to, to rely on uh, different outward mechanical things to help me get to the root of my problem or the answer that I'm looking for. And when we go back and we study next time, man, we're going to see the church and how that the Holy Spirit just came upon them and all of these issues began to be dealt with and the church began to grow and prosper. And I believe that's where we're headed. We're headed to a place where we trust the Spirit of God again, and we're going to see Him pour His glory out in the last days. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this teaching tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to be with your family. I pray it's blessed us. I pray it prepares us, Lord, to recognize and realize first of the outpouring of your power, the, the commission to go out in power, Father God, the understanding that angels work with us and we work together for kingdom reasons and for your covenant to be established for the very central fact that Jesus is coming back and we have to give that great hope to the nations of the world. And finally, Father God, we got to be led by the Holy Spirit. We got to do what you say and follow your plans and be led by your Holy Spirit. Lord, bless your people and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you Sunday. Be blessed. Amen.